Hello and welcome to this World Nuclear Association interview. My name's Jonathan Cobb. In this series of interviews, we'll be discussing some of the topics that will be up for debate at the Strategic E-Forum 2020, a series of webinars that will be held on the 9th, 10th and 11th of September 2020. But today I'm talking to Rory O'Sullivan, who is Chief Executive North America for Multex Energy, the company that's developing the Stable Salt Reactor. Rory, thank you very much for joining us. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. As we speak, the COVID-19 pandemic is still very much underway, but governments are already starting to put plans in place to help restart their economies and generate jobs. But at the same time, the imperative to move to a clean energy system is as strong as ever. So what is it that nuclear energy has to offer for all these different challenges? Well, there are major innovations happening in the nuclear industry today. Some say we're in the midst of a nuclear revolution, like we were in the 1960s, when the technologies were being developed before the big rollout in the 1970s. And there are significant economic opportunities for governments who are prepared to invest early in a new technology, especially in clean energy, beyond nuclear, of course. But nuclear not only can it play a major role in helping governments stimulate the economy, it can help them meet their clean energy targets. According to a recent IEA report, there's no credible path to net zero without a significant role for nuclear power. The nuclear sector can expand during the pandemic, meeting its climate targets and accelerating the recovery. Okay, so that's looking at those issues, but what if we look at sustainable energy? It's not just about being low carbon, it's about looking after your resources, using them efficiently, and also taking care of waste. So what is it specifically that Maltex Energy has to offer on these issues? Yeah, absolutely, thank you. Well, so we're developing a reactor called the Stable Salt Reactor Waste Burner, or the SSRW. And that's actually designed to be fueled by recycled nuclear waste, as opposed to freshly mined uranium. Our Watts to Stable Salt technology, or Watts, is actually designed to convert that spent nuclear fuel into fuel for our reactor. And so by running our reactor, the SSRW, you're actually, actually reducing the legacy waste and turning it into more clean energy. So if nuclear energy offers all these different potentials to governments, what is it that governments and other authorities should be doing to help maximize the potential that nuclear energy could make? Well, first and foremost, um, governments really need to make sure reactor developers have access to the funding me mechanisms necessary to get our designs off paper. Now, I don't like to be begging governments for funding, but current policy restrictions means it's just not possible for the private sector to do it alone. Nuclear has always been developed by governments in the past. And this includes making sure nuclear gets treated like other clean energy sources, such as wind and solar. Historically, we've been excluded from so-called green initiatives, and we won't meet our carbon targets if that stays the case. It's got to be equal for all low carbon sources. But beyond this, governments can follow the science and state unequivocally that nuclear needs to be part of our clean energy future if we want to get to zero by 2050. Governments can also help convene stakeholders to develop options and recommendations, they can facilitate engagement with indigenous peoples and communities. And they can support things like early feasibility studies. It's, it's, uh, it quite varies per country, but really it's that facilitating role that's important for government. Okay, so if that's what governments need to do to help the nuclear industry, what is it that the nuclear industry itself needs to do to maximize its potential? Well, that's a long list. There's a lot of things we need to do, but Firstly, we need to develop uh, advanced initiatives to reduce SMR capital costs, a small modular reactor capital cost. We need to develop small modular reactor demonstration units to bring credibility to project proposals and business plans. We need to have meaningful two-way engagement with indigenous people and the public well in advance of specific project proposals. We need to engage with the regulator early on through pre-licensing processes where available. We've got to get the supply chain involved 
at the appropriate time, not too early, not too late. The capabilities of the supply chain are essential for project success. And we need to get our young people trained. We need to get our workforce ready. So we need to work with the universities early in the design and development stages and other academic institutions to build that workforce. At the moment, we're not ready for a large scale SMR rollout that's needed to tackle climate change. Now, one of our panels is looking at the issues of costs and finance. So are there things that you think need to be done specifically on those issues? Well, as I mentioned earlier, governments need to provide risk share agreements for demonstration plans to enable private investment, because these have historically always been government funded. And this support can take many forms, including loan guarantees, protection against cost overruns and delays, or revenue related guarantees around power purchase agreements. In fact, given the potential benefits, that's achieving net zero, lower cost energy, the large export potential, governments might even consider funding these projects themselves. But again, that'll be case by case, depending on the country and the specific benefits. And of course, if the value is there for the taxpayer, Using government low interest rates reduces risk and final consumer costs, which is always the most important. And to be successful, the industry is going to need to innovate. So what is it about advanced technology, small modular reactors, and the technologies that Multex in particular is offering that needs to be pushed forward? It's specifically designed to increase the viability of intermittent renewables. Thanks to our grid reserve technology, the SSRW can store energy and supply it to the grid when it's needed. For example, a 300 megawatt reactor can store up its energy when renewables are not working, or when renewables are working, it can store the energy, and then discharge, say, 900 megawatts of the stored energy when renewables are not working. This partnership can enable a 100% clean energy grid at a much lower cost than renewables and electric storage. The reactor can produce clean, low-cost hydrogen. By producing heat at a much higher temperature than conventional reactors, the SOW can support ultra-efficient hydrogen processes without any carbon emissions and at a lower cost than coal or gas. This can be beneficial in heating, heavy industry, transportation, and other sectors that currently rely on fossil fuels. And then, of course, there's the SSRW's ability to reduce waste stockpiles. So if you combine all this, there's a clear need for this type of innovation on a global scale if we're going to use nuclear to decarbonize. Okay, so if governments do what they should be doing to help the nuclear industry maximize its potential, and if the industry itself continues to innovate and improve, what's your vision of the future? Well, my crystal ball for us, success looks like hundreds of reactors deployed around the world if not even thousands, resulting in a significant reduction in global emissions. That's the long-term vision. This technology is the most scalable solution I've come across to tack tackle climate change. There's no impediment that we can see that would prevent rapid scalable rollout. In the short term, we want to deploy the first of a kind reactor in New Brunswick, Canada, where we have an agreement in place with the nuclear utility MB Power and the New Brunswick government. And that's where our North American head office is, and we have an excellent relationship with them. This will allow us to demonstrate our technology and the economics, as well as the environmental benefits that come along with it. So first New Brunswick, then the world. Rory O'Sullivan, thank you very much for joining us. That concludes this interview. To find out about more interviews and more details about the panels and panelists that will form part of the World Nuclear Association Strategic E Forum 2020, please go to the event website. Or to find out more about World Nuclear Association, go to world-nuclear.org. But for today, thank you very much for joining us and goodbye.